Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Shabbat Shalom. Yep, happy to be here. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, it's been crazy. It's been uh, scary at times, but uh, yep, it's coming together, <clears throat> and it's all because of the Lord. So we're just um, we're just following His lead. So, and that's all of us, really. You know, God does all the heavy lifting. We're just walking through it. Um, so yes, um, yeah, uh, new things are scary. Um, <laughs> Even if you know God's telling you to do it. We're going to be talking about fear a lot today, actually. Um, so I want to go over the Parsha very briefly before we move into, um, you know, what uh, the Lord, you know, has for us today. Um, and before I do that, I'm just going to ask Father, just, uh, Lord, use me. Uh, anything that's of me, Father, just get rid of and move out of the way. And let today's words be from you. And uh, above all, Father, um, be glorified. And let your people be blessed. If there's somebody in here that's lacking in some way in peace, in mercy, in grace, or just needs to hear some confirmation from you, I pray that they'll get that from you and you alone in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right. So God in uh, Shalach uh, Lecha, God commands Moses to send men from each tribe, specifically a prince from each tribe, as a leader. Uh, it's, you know, everything in, in the scripture is there for a reason. Uh, that, 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 that is a very important detail. It wasn't just 10, 12 guys. It was princes. So leaders, renowned people, well-respected. Uh, to go from the wilderness where Israel was camped into the land of Canaan to investigate it. 12 men were sent. They spent 40 days investigating the land and returned with fruit from the land. They reported back to Moses and the entire assembly that the land was indeed good. Of course, God said it was good. He told Moses in chapter 3 of Exodus, he goes, it's a good land. But you go look. It's going to be exactly how I said. It's a good land. But the people there, but the people there were powerful and the cities would be fortified. Ten out of the twelve men said, we can't do it. We can't, we're not going to be able to do this. God has brought us this far and now he's dropping us. Now, you see, if God were to do that, he wouldn't be God. He had brought them very far, and now these ten men, leaders in the community, are saying, we can't do it. Game over. Game over, man. Um, so, only two of the ten men, Joshua and Caleb, remained faithful and, conv and convinced they could possess the land. Were Joshua and Caleb scared? It doesn't say. Maybe. But if they were, they still said, hey, I'm freaked out, but I'm trusting God. That he's going to do this. The bad report caused a near mutiny. See, you got 10 men. So fear and panic's contagious anyway, but when 10 people who are well respected start running around and saying, hey, it's over. We're done. We can't do this. We can't attack these people. We won't win. It caused a near mutiny. The people cried in fear all night, grumbled against Moses and Aaron, infamously said, quote, if we had only died in Egypt. Furthermore, the people refused to go forward. They stopped. They said, we're not going. We're going back to Egypt. Let's get a new leader. In fact, some of them threatened to stone Moses and Aaron. After Moses, so you want to talk about how easy it is to be in leadership. Um, Moses interceded for the people and God forgave them. However, he swore that the first generation that left Egypt would not enter the land. So God forgives, but the consequences remain. That generation would not enter the land. The Parsha concludes with God giving further commands to Moses regarding fragrant aroma offerings, punishments for intentional versus unintentional sin, which means sin you mean to commit versus sin that you weren't intending to commit. Um, a, particularly, a particularly important command that I like to talk about and highlight just for a brief moment, that the regulations of the Torah apply to both native-born Israelites and people coming from the outside who are joining the community. They're called outsiders, not because God looks at them like, oh, they're outsiders, they're second class, but because they came from the outside and saw that God was, that the God of Israel was the God, not just a God, and wanted to be a part of this thing. So he's all inclusive. So he wants to, so he's saying, in fact, the, the scripture says, they sh, uh, the foreigner, uh, the outsider, and the native born shall be alike before the Lord. Alike which means God doesn't see one as better than the other. So there's no cause for discrimination or cause to think that because you're native-born Jewish that you have it over an outsider who's come, who's come in. God loves both the same and expects, not only, the, not only gives the benefits, but expects the responsibilities from both. 
Okay, so that's the Parsha. I want to talk about fear today because I think it's something we all contend with. I'm sorry if I keep messing with this. It's a little shaky. All right, so uh, fear. Fear occurs in the Bible a lot. There's actually two types of fear in the Scripture. There's a good type of fear, and there's a bad type of fear. Let's look at one example. King David wrote Psalm 34, uh, verse 10, and here's what it says. This is King David. You know, he wrote, he's credited with, uh, I'd say, 75 of the 150 Psalms. Uh, that should be, that's Psalm 2410. Should be Psalm 34. Let me just read it. Um, but yes, he is the king of glory. Um, I'm just going to read Psalm 3410. Hold on one second. Young lions lack food and go hungry, but those who fear the Lord will not lack any good thing. Come, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Okay, that's Psalm 34. So this is David saying, come, I'll teach you the fear of the Lord. What kind of fear is that? It's not, hey, come, I'll teach you how to be terrified of God. <laughs> He's really scary. He is, depending on what side of the line you're on. But what I'm saying is, is that this isn't the kind of, this is a moral reverence. This is a fear that leads to obedience. This is a fear that leads to respecting God and honoring him. You fear him. You worship him. When we worship God, it's, it's an expression of our fear for him. He's great and awesome. Let's go to Psalm 55, verses 2 through 6. This is King David again. So in Psalm 34, he's saying, hey, God's great. I'm going to teach you how to fear him and how to obey his commands and things like that. But in Psalm 55, I don't know what's going on in David's life, but it's not so great. Give ear, O God, to my prayer. Do not ignore my plea for help. Listen to me and answer me. I am restless in my complaint and moan. Here we go. Because of the voice of the enemy, because of the pressure of the wicked. For they thrust trouble on me and in anger bear a grudge against me. My heart shudders within me and the terrors of death sweep over me. Fear and trembling come upon me and horror has overwhelmed me. This is King David. This is the giant slayer. This is the giant slayer. This is so important. This is why I love the Psalms. This is why I love the scripture. So brutally honest. It doesn't take anything out about our forefathers that was necessarily, that could be like, I don't want to know how, I don't want to know how horrified I was. No, David's being open and honest, and God is letting us see that King David the giant slayer, a man of great faith. I mean, read the story in uh, Samuel about how David faces up to Goliath with such faith and such authority. But something happened years later, after he's been king, that has him horrified. To the point where if you keep reading the psalm, he says, I wish I could leave. Like, I want to leave. I want to leave my home. I'm so scared. This is the kind of fear we're talking about today. That is not fear of the Lord. That's fear for your life. That's fear of a circumstance. That's fear for your safety. That's fear uh, that your life's going to fall apart, that something's going to happen to you. I, I struggle with that. Uh, de uh, what we all do, depending on what the situation is. But for me, I'm just going to tell you a story. Um, I do actually have a lot of anxiety about moving into a new house. Um, I've always had it. Uh, when, Brooke and I got uh, when Brooke and I got married in our first apartment, I had anxiety about it. Then we moved into our second apartment, and I had anxiety about it. Then we bought our first house in Savannah, and I remember the first week or so really feeling uncomfortable in it and feeling really stressed out. Aside from the fact that everything that goes with buying a house, which is like the loan and the closing, and you feel like you're signing your life away and all these things, you know, it's scary. These things are scary. I think sometimes we feel like as believers, because God is our Father and God is our God and He's with us, that we should just never be afraid. And we think that when we are afraid that we're somehow letting God down and that He's looking at us shaking his head with like disappointment like I just can't believe you just don't believe me more and that's not the case but I had a lot of anxiety so at this point in our life me and Brooke it's like 2013 um, we're, 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 we need to move closer to my job uh, we lived in Macon at the time we were about an hour from my work and it was just becoming really hard so I'm trying to um I'm trying to, we're trying to find places that we can just rent for a little while just to be a little bit closer to my job. And um, 
I'm driving one day, and, and everything was just really expensive because at the time, Brooke had just had Yossi. He was three months old. Uh, so we were only on my income, and I was a teacher, and that should tell you everything. You didn't have a lot of money. Right. And rent was like a 1000 bucks a month, and, and, and where we were at, it was, just, it was just up there, you know? And one day, I'm driving, um, and, and, and I'm worried. I'm stressed out, and, and I'm fearful, and I'm like, God, what are you doing? What's happening? I mean, come on. we got to, you know. We need to move out of my mom's place, and we need to get into a, a, a better situation, uh, but we need to be able to afford it, but it's only my income, you know, because Brooke just had a baby. And So one day, I'm driving home from work. I have an hour drive ahead of me to get back to Macon, and uh, I'm sitting at a red light, and I can't explain to you how or why. Well, I know why, but I can't explain to you how I heard it. Have you ever tried to explain to someone how God talks to you? You can't really explain it, but you know he does, you know? And I just, I'm sitting at a red light, and I just felt like God said, turn right. And I was like, I feel like I'm supposed to do this. I don't know if it's God. And sometimes you do those things, and it's not God. It was just you. But God always has a way of confirming it. So I'm sitting there, and I just turn right. And I'm driving. And a ways down the road, I see a for rent sign. A ways down, a ways down the road, I see a for rent sign. I get out, and I walk up to this house that is probably about as wide as the sanctuary and probably it was a perfect rectangle it was as wide as the sanctuary and it was probably like double the size of this stage it was really small it was a one bedroom cottage and I called the number I called the number on the rental property and the woman picked up a, and it was a, an answer machine it said hello this is for a one bedroom cottage $400 a month boom there we go $400 a month that's it but it was really tiny. So I called Brooke and said, Brooke, th I know we can afford this. It's in a nice area. It's really small, but I know we can do it. it I mean, we'll see, right? <laughs> so I called the lady, and she meets with me, and she go, and uh, Brooke comes too, and, and, and we get there, and she's like, I'll show you the property. So she walks us in, and when I walk in, I'm immediately, like, arrested with fear. Why? Because the place is so small. It's so small. I'm like... I mean, like, the ceiling was, like, right here. I was like, oh, man, I can't, I can't be in here long. I really felt that way. I felt like I was almost kind of losing my breath a little bit. Like, it was really scary. Aside from the fact that I'm moving, I don't know, you know, it's just I have all these anxieties. It, it, was, I, it was fearful to me. Well, we're walking around, and we're looking at the house. I'm kind of like, oh, my God, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I can't do this. This is too small. It's too tiny. I don't know how we're going to do this. We've got a baby, one bedroom. There's not going to be any privacy. I don't know how we're going to fit our things in here. And then Brooke stops me and goes, do you see it? And I was like, what? And she goes, look. And she points. And when you walk into the house, it's like you walk into the kitchen. And it was a little place. And I'd say about right here on the wall was a frame with that uh, with wood with that chalkboard stuff paint over it. It's the, the you paint it and you can write with chalk. You know, it's like great for kids. You know what I'm talking about? It was that, and it had something written on it in Hebrew. Right. And Brooke goes, "Do you see it?" And I was like, "Yes." Understand something? Brooke and I are Messianic believers. We're we're, we're Jewish, Messianic Jewish believers. How in the world? What are the chances? God tells me to turn right. I get to this house. I walk in, and there on the wall is something in Hebrew. Guys, God will tell you exactly what you're supposed to do. He knows exactly how to tell you. He knows when to tell you. He knows exactly what you need to know. Now, I read that. It said, I, I am my beloved's, and my beloved's is mine. That was actually what it said. But I just couldn't believe it. God was like, I know you're still scared, and I know this place is really cramped, and I know that it might be tough a little bit, but at least you know. This is the place. This is the place. God will not, God doesn't want you to do the wrong thing. He wants you to follow him. He wants you to obey him. Can you guys still hear me if I let this go? Because I can't keep, good Lord. Because um, I'm right. All right. Can I? Yeah. Oh, great. That's... So, what I'm saying is, in my fear, in my doubt, God doesn't expect you to be brave. Can anybody honestly say that they're on their A game 24 hours a day and seven days a week? That's ridiculous. And to but, but you know what's even worse? 
from expecting that from ourselves is we think that God looks at us like we're supposed to be that way. Only one was on his A game. He's the one who you're in and he's in you and God sent him for a purpose because none of us were ever, could ever do it. So I'm scared and I'm freaking out and here's God still saying, I know you're scared, but look, look, so you can have some peace. Does God want you to be afraid? No, not because he, it's a sin to be afraid, because he wants you to enjoy the ride. He wants you just to enjoy the ride. He wants you to be peaceful. But we don't all have that. We don't all have that. Fear is an emotion, but so is boldness. Being bold, that's, I mean, yes, it can, it, can, it can be applied to action, but being bold also is an emotion. Emotions don't matter to God. He's interested in what you're going to do. He's like, yeah, they're scared, but I want to see what they're going to do. Are they going to step forward or are they going to run away? Because that's the problem. Fear is never a problem when you feel it. It's a problem when it leads you to disobey. And we're going to talk about that's what happened in the Parsha. So let's look at the Parsha. I know it took a while for me to tell that story, but I wanted to let you know, even though you're fearful, even in your fear, in your uncertainty, and in your doubt, God is going to make it so clear to you what you're supposed to do. By the way, we did move into that little house. We lived there for nine months, and it was nine of the best months of our lives, some of the best months of our lives. We loved that little place. It turned out to be so neat and cool, and we outgrew it because we had another kid. But what I'm saying is, it turned out to be wonderful. And a lot of times what we think is going to be, there's no way this is not going to work out. It's exactly what you need. It's, exact, and it's exactly what you want. Fear is an emotion we all feel. All of us are afraid of something. Indeed, God doesn't want us to be afraid, but we can't believe the myth. This is a myth I want to dispel. That being afraid is a sin or that being afraid makes God angry. Fear in itself is an emotion. It does take our joy away. But when it's not an issue until fear leads to a decision to shrink back from doing the right thing, fear leading us to disobey God, which is what the children of Israel do in this Parsha. Let's look at the first scripture. I go back a little bit before the Parsha to Exodus 3 because this is what God tells Moses about the land. So Exodus 3. Adonai said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their slave masters, for I know their pains. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians to bring them up out of that land into a good and large land, a land flowing with milk and honey. When, I, when you talk about the promised land, what do you think? Milk and honey. Into the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. So God says three things. It's good. It's large flowing with milk and honey, and there is people living there. But God says it's a good land. I'm going to take them out. I'm going to bring them in. So they knew this. The children of Israel knew that God had said it's a good land. It's a big land, and I'm going to give it to you. But when it comes to the point of about to do it, now, now, but now we're about to do it. See, we talk about it, right? Now we're about to do it. We're about to do it, and this is what happens. Numbers 13, 27. This is in the Parsha. The spies come back and they're talking to Moses. They gave their account to him and said, we went into the land where you sent us. Indeed, it is flowing with milk and honey. This is some of its fruit. In other words, oh, God was right about that. It's a good place. Here we go. <laughs> Numbers 13, 32. They continue on. They spread a bad report, though. The 10 out of the 12 among B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel, a bad report about the land they had explored, saying... The land through which we passed, the land through which we passed to explore, excuse me, the land through which we passed to explore devours its residents. That's so not only are they saying it's bad, they're really being descriptive. They're doing a good job. They're man, man, it devours people. All the people we saw there are men of great size. So this causes fear. Numbers 14, 1 through 4. How did the people respond? All through that night, the entire community raised up their voices. The people wept. Has God come in at any point yet and done anything? No. He's not come up and said, hold on, hold on, hold on. He's not gotten mad at the 10 spies who are spreading a bad report. And he has not gotten, gotten upset at B'nai Yisrael. They grumbled again. He's not gotten upset yet. All B'nai Yisrael grumbled against Moses and Aaron and the whole community said, if only we had died in Egypt, if only we had died in this wilderness. Has God come in yet? No. 
God's listening. He's like, okay, they're freaking out. It's getting worse. Why is that and I bringing us to this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be like plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? And God's like, oh no. And then they do it. Let's choose a leader and go back. There it goes. They did, they were, okay, there it goes. Not the fear, not the freaking out, as, as horrible, I know, as shame. And we've all freaked out. We've all panicked. And the whole time God's like, it's okay, it's okay. But when they said, let's just turn around, God's like, no, now you're disobeying. Now you're disobeying. Let's choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Moses, Aaron, and Joshua try to calm the people down. Let's go to the next one. Moses, uh, excuse me, Numbers 14. Moses and Aaron fall on their faces before the entire assembly of the community of B'nai Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who are among those who explore land, tore their clothes. They're like, no, don't go this way with it, guys. They said to the whole assembly of B'nai Israel, the land through which we pass is an exceptionally good land. If Adonai is pleased with us, he will lead us to that land and will give it to us. A land flowing with milk and honey. They're saying, remember what he said? Remember what he said? If he said part of it was true, if part of what he said was true, and we saw part of what he said, then that means the whole thing, that he'll give it to us. He told Moses it was good and that he'd give it to us. We see that it's good, so he's going to give it to us. If God, listen, if God can't do one thing in your life and be faithful to it, he's not God. If, there's, if, if he brings you up to age 99 and then blows it one day, he's not God. So then that means he's got to be God. He's either all you say he is or he's nothing. Like Yeshua, the Messiah. He's either the Messiah or he's some nut. He's the Messiah. He's all of, and if he's the Messiah, then he's everything. Only don't rebel against Adonai. Don't be afraid of the people of the land. They will be food for us. The protection over them is gone. Adonai is with us. Don't fear them. But the whole assembly talked violently about stoning them. Now here comes God. Then the glory of the Lord appeared. So God's like, okay, now it's over. Okay, so when did God respond when they said, we're not taking the land and we're going to kill our current leaders? That's when God came. They freaked out, they stomped, they're, uh, and God's just going, well, they haven't done, they, they still might go, they still might, well, he knows what they're going to do, but what I'm saying is they can still make the choice to go, even in this fear. It was when they said, let's get another leader, and let's kill these two. After everything that God's brought them through, all right, I'm not trying to talk bad about the children of Israel, because we all get that scared. We all get that scared at times. We all get that afraid. What does God say? Numbers 14, 22 through 23. None of the people who saw my glory and my miraculous signs I performed in Egypt in the wilderness yet tested me these 10 times and did not obey my voice. Not one of them will see the land I promised to their forefathers. None of those who treated me with contempt will see it. None. God disciplined the children of Israel by not letting the first generation enter the land with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, the two people that said, please stop, we can do it. Maybe they were afraid too. Maybe, who knows? Maybe they're like, look, I'm freaked out too, but look, this is God, okay? Moses confirms the problem, and when he recounts the story in Deuteronomy chapter one, he recounts to the children of Israel, he said they took their, and he's talking about the spies, this is Moses later on, they took in their hands some of the fruit of the land and brought it down to us. They also brought back word to us and said, good is the land that Adonai is giving to us. So it's like God was right about one thing, but not about the other. Yet you would not go up. This is what Moses says. Not you were scared. Noticed, Moses, I know, bear with me. Moses doesn't say, but you were scared. And that was really insulting to God. He says, you wouldn't go. What am I saying? I'm saying sometimes God's like, okay, you're scared. I'm not concerned with how you feel. Are you going to go? Are you going to do what I asked? Because that's what God wants more than your feelings. He wants to know what you're going to do yet, because whatever you're going to do, if he told you to do it, he's going to be with you to see it through. The battle belongs to the Lord. We sung that the battle belongs to the Lord. What's God saying? Just show up and watch what I do. 
you would not go up, but rebelled against the command of Adonai, your God. You wouldn't go. God's not upset when you're afraid. That's what I'm saying. That's what I think part of the revelation here is. That God's not upset when you're afraid. You can be cowering and shaking in your boots, terrified. Your knees can be knocking. But as long as you're moving forward, not only is it counted as obedience, it's bravery. There's a saying, you can, fear is, a, a being brave isn't not the absence of fear. It's when you're shaking in your boots and you still saddle up your horse. God will be with you. I tell you, it's even more impressive sometimes for God. He's like, so that means if there's two people that God tells to do something, one is bold doing it and obeying. One is bold doing it, obeying, great. Then there's the other one, fearful, doing it and obeying. It's the same blessing. God's like, look at that. They're bold. That's great. I'm proud. But he's like, but this one's scared and he's still doing it. Bold, brave. We have to understand what God sees as bravery. It's not these big, like, oh, yeah, we can do it. I'm, uh, you know. It's not that. That's not the appearance of that. That's not what it looks like. Someone else made this. Uh, there, there's other examples. Let's look at Saul, King Saul. A, another example of someone who allowed fear to control him. Uh, is that it? First uh, Samuel 13, 5 through 14. Um, I don't know if that's it. Huh? That's chapter 6. It should be 1 Samuel 13, 5 through 14. All right, let me just read it. All right, sorry, guys. In 1 Samuel, we know that we're dealing with King Saul. Um, hold on. I wasn't expecting that to look for it. All right, here it goes. 1 Samuel 13, 5 through 14. Here we go. All right, the Philistines gathered to fight against Israel. Now, we know during Saul's kingship, they warred with the Philistines, right? The men of Israel saw that they were in trouble because the troops were in a difficult situation. So the Philistines show up to fight. Israel's in a difficult situation. They hid in caves, thickets, among rocks and holes and in cisterns. They're hiding in wells. That's it. Boom. Let's keep going then. Okay. I'll just... Okay, so... Yep, they're hiding. I just read that part. Some of the Hebrews even crossed over to the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead, but as for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, but all the people following him were trembling. So Saul is the king. The people around him are freaking out. So he waits seven days, the time set by Samuel, to make a sacrifice to God. But Samuel had not come to Gilgal, so the people began to scatter from Saul. This is what happened. Saul said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. So he did it. We understand what the problem is? Everybody's scared. Saul is the king. I'm sure they're looking at him like, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? And Saul had a command. It was, wait for Samuel. Wait for Samuel. Don't you do it, Saul. Wait for Samuel. But Saul, it doesn't say Saul was afraid. We didn't read that at all. We didn't read that Saul was afraid. But I can tell Saul's afraid. How? Because what does Saul do? He makes the burnt offering, but it was in response to the people leaving. Saul was one of those leaders, you see, that didn't feel like a leader unless he had people around him. You see, Saul wanted to feel like king. This is Saul's problem. He's got to have people around him. People can't, people can't leave. That stuff still happens today in synagogues and congregations and churches. I can't confront that person. They'll leave. I can't make this decision. People will get mad and leave. If God's telling you to do it and some people leave, what are you going to do? Saul allowed people leaving for him to go, okay, well, that's okay, guys. Saul had a perfect opportunity to say, everybody stop. Everybody stop. Look at what God's done for us up to this point. We got to wait a little longer. 
okay? Let's have faith. Let's be still. Hold your peace. Hold your peace. Stand still. But no, Saul didn't do that. He goes, okay, well, just give me the offering. I'll do it. I'll make you guys happy. I'll make you guys happy. But as soon as he finished, Samuel shows up. Saul went out to meet and greet him. Notice this. Samuel asked, what have you done? Not Samuel didn't say, man, the, the men look scared. That's a problem. He didn't go up to Saul and say, Saul, you're looking really insecure as a leader. He goes, what did you do? What have you done? Saul replied, because I saw the people were scattering from me. I didn't feel like such a big king in that moment. And that you, and I needed to make these people happy, you see. And that you had not come within the appointed days, so you see it's Samuel's fault. And that the Philistines were assembling at Michmas. I thought, now the Philistines are about to advance against me at Gilgal, but I've not yet entreated I deny all of this. This makes no sense to me. I forced myself. <laughs> what do you look in a mirror and you, you will do it. And offered the burnt offering. So Saul did it out of fear. Fear. The people were leaving him. He's like, no, 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 we can't do that. I got to make these people happy. Samuel said to Saul, you have acted foolishly, not by being scared. By not keeping the commandment of Adonai, your God, which he commanded you, for now Adonai would have established your kingship over Israel forever. So Saul blew it. Why? Because God's like, I can't have a guy over my people who's going to do, who's going to be afraid of what other people do. It's going to allow other people to sway him. And it, it says here, Samuel's not lying. He said to Saul, he goes, you would have had a dynasty. But now look at what you've done. You've acted foolishly. You let people sway you can't do that fear may rise I'll fear may rise I'll even say it will rise fear will rise in you you will be afraid of something but you can't let that stop your forward motion God is with you to sit he's with you to see you through what he commands you to do to see you through your trials fear doesn't make him leave it's when we act foolishly by allowing fear to control us to control us to lead us to disobey. God has picked scared people throughout the history, if we look at Scripture. Let's look at Gideon. Let's look at Judges chapter 6, verse 11 through 12. This is when Gideon's chosen. Uh, the angel of Adonai came and sat under the terebinth that was at Orphus, a tree. So the angel of, the Adonai, com angel of Adonai comes and sits at the bottom of the tree. That belonged to Joash the Abizrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press, normal so far. But he's in the wine press. So he's beating out wheat. That's normal. But he's doing it in a wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. So Gideon's hiding when God finds him. He's hiding from the Midianites. He's hiding from a group of people. He's hiding. Who hides? People who are afraid. He's beating out wheat in the wine press. And look at what God says to him. God says, Adonai is with you, O mighty man of valor. He's hiding. And God said, hello, mighty man of valor. I'm with you. That's so backwards. That's God. The bottom line is Gideon was hiding when God called him brave. Gideon who would destroy the armies of Midian with just 300 people. Why? Because God said, there's a guy who's going to give all the credit to me. There's a guy who even when he's afraid, he's going to move forward. He's going to move forward even when he's afraid. Let's look at King Jehoshaphat, it happened after this. This is King Jehoshaphat, one of the few righteous kings after David. This is in Judah. It happened after this, the Moabites and the Ammonites together came with other Ammonites to make war against Jehoshaphat. He was a king. He was righteous. He loved God. And even though he loved God, though, he finds himself in trouble. Yet yeah, being one of God's kids and loving God with all your heart doesn't exempt you from having trouble. So what happens? So they came to make war against him. Some came and reported to Jehoshaphat saying, a great multitude, what does that mean? A lot of people are coming against you. Can you imagine you're having a great day and then somebody comes, hey, a bunch of people are coming from beyond the sea, from Aram and are already in Hazazon Tamar, that is in Gedi. What's Joseph, Jehoshaphat's response? I wonder, Jehoshaphat was afraid. He was afraid, but here's what he did. He didn't go, everybody pack your bags, we're getting out of here. He said, 
he resolved to seek the Lord. And then because of that, what do the people do? They sought help from the Lord. Indeed, they came, everybody showed up and said, let's seek God. Why? Because the leader's seeking God. And he's afraid. That's inspiring to me. Like, hey, I'm scared too. Let's all seek the Lord. This Jehoshaphat, that Elizabeth during her prayer said, our weapons against God are up upraised hands in praise that's exactly who god put in the front of the army he goes get a bunch of so we're gonna get our best man no no no. get a bunch of musicians they're gonna lead the army and they showed up and it was a battlefield full of corpses god already did it god's like but what did they have to do they had to show up they had to show up can you imagine if jehoshaphat was like no we're not going if you said you're gonna do it god you just do it and we'll just and god's like you're gonna go you're gonna go you're gonna obey afraid but obedient Afraid, but moving forward. The situation with Gideon is really powerful, I think, because it tells us that Gideon was hiding when God found him and called him a mighty man of valor. What it tells us is two things. It tells us, one, that God choose, does choose the least likely that we would think would be chosen. But secondly, it tells us that when God saw Gideon, he didn't see a scared little boy who thought he was the least in his family. He saw who Gideon could be with him. You see, God looks at you. He doesn't see you at your lowest. He looks and sees you at your best. He sees you at your complete, as your complete and your most whole ability. That's what God looks. He looks and sees the best in you. He looks and sees the best in you. Sometimes we have to work to fight our own view of ourselves and receives God and receive God's view of us. And that's the hardest thing to do. That's the hardest thing for me to do is trying to get rid of how I view myself and receive how God sees you. You know, the scripture says that we're masterpieces. I mean, I find a hard time receiving that about myself because we fail and we fall short and we get scared and we don't feel brave and we don't feel like people that are gonna inherit the kingdom of God. But it's those people that don't think that much of themselves that God's like, oh, that one. He'll give me credit. She'll give me credit. That's what I want. I'm going to have the worship team come up. No, that's good. You can read that. You can put that back up. That's an awesome prayer. That's what Jehoshaphat prayed. He said, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we have no power... That's incredible. That's what God wants. He wants you to go to him and say, God, I have no power to deal with this situation ahead of me. What are you dealing with today? What do you have ahead of you? What are you praying about? What's burdening you? It could be something internal. It could be something, it could be something you're struggling with. It could be a personal situation, relationship, marriage. You might not even be able to put words to it. Just some attack, some secret battle going on inside of you. And you don't have the power to face this great multitude that's attacking you. You don't know what to do. It's like, I love this. He, he tells God, we don't know what to do. Can you imagine if your king said that, your leader? He's like, we don't know what to do. And he's like, oh, God, we don't know. But our eyes are on you. That's one of my favorite prayers in scripture. Just that sentence. That's all you have to say to God. I don't know what to do. But my eyes are on you. And God's like, now we're talking. Now we're getting somewhere. Yeshua knew what we would be dealing with in this world. This is why he says this. He goes, you thought this would be easy? Because some people, I think, think that. They think that a life with God's gonna be easy. It's actually harder. But this is what Yeshua says. And John, when he's talking to his disciples, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before you. I don't mean just the world, like people hating you because you're a believer, even though you don't have to look very far in, in the world today to see how... The, how the kingdom of God is getting attacked. But what I'm saying is, Yeshua said, not just people, I'm talking about circumstances, just the whole spiritual nature. Look, I'm, I don't want to sit here and praise the adversary or praise Satan in any way, but he has power. He has a measure of power. Otherwise, we'd be fine. We'd all be sitting here and we'd be fine. And Yeshua wouldn't have to say, remember, you're going to be up against it sometimes in this world. But remember, I was up against it before you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but you're not of the world. Since I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you.
This is why not long before he was arrested, one of the last things I've, I've heard it said, if you really want to listen to, to, to what some... To, to what's important to somebody. Listen to what they say not long before they die. Yeshua knew his time was coming. And one of the last things he says to his disciples, he says, these things I have spoken to you so that in me, you may have shalom. In the world, you will have trouble. If he stopped there, we'd be worried. He says, but take heart. I've already beaten it. It's already done. Much of what we battle with is a war that's already won. You're gonna lose some battles. You're not gonna you're not gonna you're not gonna beat every temptation. You're not gonna you're not gonna succeed in everything God puts before you. But you're, you've already won the war. Yeshua has overcome the world. I want to share I want to share a story with you because uh, the Lord told me to share it. It's actually, you know. Have you ever tried to share the Bible with a non-believer? I mean, if you have, I really tip my hat off to you because trying to talk to a non-believer who doesn't know this about God is really tough because they don't know the Bible. They don't know the Bible. So how do they know what God's done in your life? It's your testimony, your personal testimony, what God has done for you. And I'm gonna share with you today. One of the moments, uh, one of, I would say one of the, the most important moments I think that God if, if I could prove that if, if there was ever a time when God said unequivocally he's real and it was when me and Brooke were dating um, which was actually I just told you I began this sermon talking about how I'm a person that tends to struggle with uh, anxiety I get re things really I, I overanalyze I can I can work myself up into a near panic and I've done that before it's been a long time but I've I had a panic attack before I'm not afraid of saying that everybody standing up here should talk about their weaknesses I'm no better than you so uh, what happened was Brooke and I met and when two people meet to court each other to date even if they're believers they have issues and baggage I had mine Brooke had hers and we had been dating for about a month, and I, I started to know that I was falling in love with her. But my response, you would think, would be like a movie you watch. <laughs> Joy, I'm falling in love with the love of my life. No, actually, I started to become terrified. <laughs> I couldn't sleep because of my own issues with some personal things with marriage, things I grew up with. I was terrified of marriage. When I realized that she was the one, when God was like, this is it. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> afraid of commitment. I'm in love with her, but what if I wake up one day and I'm not? What if something happens? What if she's not the one guy? What if I'm hearing wrong? What if I'm listening to me and not you? What, what if I'm, what if I'm, what if I'm, what if I'm, and I'm working myself up to where I can't sleep. For three months, July, August, and September, I could barely, I had to force myself to eat one meal a day over the internal struggle and, and um, crisis over whether or not she's supposed to be the one for me. At the same time, I, was, I started going through that. You started to have a little problem of your own. You see, Brooke came from Dallas. We were in a long distance relationship. And Brooke had some people that were very supportive of me and her. Brooke was very involved in her congregation in Dallas. But for every person that supported you, there was at least one other person that didn't like that we were together. They just didn't agree with it. They thought it was too fast. We weren't hearing from God. We even had a person send you a message to say, you are closed to the voice of God about our marriage. It's amazing what people think that they can say to you about your life with God. So I was dealing with internal pressure and struggle because of anxiety. Brooke was dealing with external pressure. This was all happening at the same time. We were just two kids who loved God that wanted to fall in love and be happy. Wanted that peace, that shalom, that peace that passes all understanding. This went on for months, all of July, all of August, and then September happened and I visited. Uh, I flew there to Dallas and everything came to a head. It was like I couldn't hold it in anymore, uh, the fear and the anxiety. I just couldn't keep it together. You, our strength is so limited. And the whole time, of course, God's there. It's not like God's like, oh, I need to deal with this. I've left them waiting a little long. He knows, but it's all about timing. So Brooke, she's at a breaking point with how people are treating her about me. You don't need to go to Georgia. 
you have things to do here. Who is this guy anyway? So the last night I was there, it was Labor Day weekend. It was a Sunday, I believe. We decided, or maybe it was a Saturday night and I flew back Sunday. It was a Saturday night. And I decided, and I'm telling you this, listen, I'm not telling you this because I wanna say, hey, look at what my God did for me. I'm saying, look at what your God, our God does. We go out and we have a picnic because we just wanted to be away from everybody. And we're sitting there and we lay, we lay the blanket out and we lay the food out and we sit down and we look at each other and you just start crying. We just couldn't take it anymore. We just wanted peace. So I scooted over next to Brooke and I put my arm around her and I started to sing this song that was really popular on Christian radio. Has anybody ever heard, please raise your hand if you've ever heard of a guy named Chris Tomlin. How great is our God, right? Indescribable. Um, good, good father. I've followed him for almost 20 years. I've played his songs from worship stages. He's still on the radio, I'm sure. He had written a song at the time called I Will Rise. Yeshua, uh, Jesus Messiah is another one of his songs, right? So uh, I Will Rise, though. I, I, I put my arms around Brooke and I started to sing it. I'm not going to sing it right now. But I'm going to tell you what the words say. It says, there's a peace I've come to know though my heart and flesh may fail. So which means God says you can know peace even when everything around you and inside of you is failing. There's a peace I've come to know, though my heart and flesh may fail. There's an anchor for my soul. I can say it is well. Yeshua has overcome and the grave is overwhelmed. The victory is won. He has risen from the dead and I will rise when he calls my name. No more sorrow. No more pain. I will rise on eagle's wings before my God fall on my knees and rise. So I sang that and we cried and it was a nice night, but we had to go to the airport the next day. I had to go back to Georgia with all my crap still inside. She had to stay in Texas with everything around her. And we sat on the floor in the airport just sobbing because we didn't want to leave. So I get my bags and I get on the plane. Has anybody ever gotten on an airplane? What's the first thing you pass through before you, when you get on the airplane? Well, security, and then you get on the airplane, and what section of the plane are you passing through first? First class, first class boom. <laughs> so I'm pulling my bag through, and I'm just in an emotional daze. And I look down, and sitting on an aisle seat to my left, is this guy on a Blackberry, and I swear to God, he looked just like Chris Tomlin. Chris Tomlin, I just sang this song yesterday over my wife, and, and I mean, future wife, in one of our lowest, most terrified moments, and there's a guy that looks just like him, to the point where I had to say, excuse me, and he's on his, and he goes, and I said, are you Chris Tomlin? And he said, yes. Last night, I'm with my wife and we're about to break and I sing this song and the next day on a plane, I meet the guy who writes it. Who does that? What are the chances? Don't tell me about coincidence. Don't tell me, no one. I've, I've got friends that aren't believers and I tell them that story and they can't say a word. I don't, I didn't have time to talk to him, I wanted to. I, I, he said, where do you go to church? I said, I go to a Messianic synagogue. He probably don't even know what that is. Maybe he does. I'm sorry, Chris Tomlin, if you're listening. <laughs> I sat down. I don't remember the plane ride because I was in such a, such disbelief. It was like euphoric. We could, you want to know why God doesn't come down all the time and do something right? There's no way we would be able to function. We'd never go to work. We can't handle how powerful he is. I just sat there and stared straight ahead like I was in a trance on the plane. And I'm telling you, did I hear from God after that? I felt like I was like, oh, we don't have to say anything. <laughs> he knows. He knows I'm the Lord. So I'm going to read this last scripture and I'm going to have Brooke sing this song because she can do it so much better than me. And this is the song we sang. And this is the song that God wants to sing over you today. 
I don't know what you're dealing with. But I tell you one thing. This God that we talk about, this God, he's real. Not because you believe in him or because you think he is, because he just is. Let's read this scripture because if God were to say anything to me, it'd probably be this. Isaiah chapter 40, if we have it. I'm going to read it and then, to whom then will you liken me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Who does it like God? Who takes care of you like him? He goes, he even says, he goes, why don't you do it? Look up there at the stars. Look up on high and see. Who created these? The one who brings out their host by number. The one who calls them all by name. You know, we have names for planets and stars. Yeah, okay. God, God's known their name for, for ages. He calls them by name, and because of his great strength and vast power, not one of them is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel? Take Jacob and Israel out and put your name in there. God would ask you, why do you think my way is hidden from Adonai and the justice due me escapes the notice of my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? Adonai is the eternal God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow tired or weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Was it hard for him to sit Chris Tomlin down next to me? God's like, that wasn't hard, kid. Just wait. Wait, all of us, I feel like God's telling us, just wait and see what I do. Wait till the end of this thing. He gives strength to the weary. And to the one without vigor, he gives might. Even youths get tired. You guys get tired. <laughs> I watched this show with David, uh, the American Ninja Warrior. These guys doing flips and crazy crap. They stumble and fall. No. They that wait for Adonai will renew their strength. They will soar up with wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and won't be faint. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.